In South Africa, it is called sextortion. In Gabon, it is referred to as STGs, sexually transmitted grades. And in Zimbabwe, it is called a thigh for a mark. You are welcome to another episode of Chapters. And today we are talking about the very important scourge of sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, sexual molestation in our schools, actually primary, secondary, and tertiary across Africa. And I have with me, he's a writer, he's a journalist, he's a former presidential spokesperson, Mr. Shegun Adeniyi, who wrote the book Naked Abuse, Sex for Grades in African Universities. Mr. Thank Adeniyi, you, for... you are so welcome to Chapters. Thank you very much for having me this morning. It's, it's afternoon now. It's afternoon now. <laughs> It is so good to have you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you for being you. here. And I want thank to say you. thank you for writing this book. Because, you know, when I saw the book, I remember when I saw the book and I thought, okay, this is not really down your alley. So I was wondering what even inspired you to write the book on this conversation in the first place. Yeah. And that, and I, that's, that, that gives me an opportunity to pay tribute to my late friend, uh, Innocent Chukuma, the West African director of Ford, who died, unfortunately, about two or three months ago. He was the one who inspired the idea. My, the book I actually had in mind was a political book. And he said, look, Shegu, this is a very, very topical issue. Why don't you deal with this? The, the scandal at IFE had just happened at that period. That was early in 2018. And he said, this is a very serious issue. I, I will, it's something that I would like you to tackle. See, I have three, he told me that he had three daughters, mm -hmm. and this issue bothers him a lot. Of course, I, it's something that I thought about before, but I never really, it was not damn early to, to write a book about it. He was the one who inspired the idea. So I, 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 I want to pay tribute to him, especially now that he is now late. Thank you, son. May he indeed rest in peace. And I want to say thank you for taking that advice because, like I said, when I saw it, I truly said, this is not Mr. Denny's kind of topic. So thank you for giving that backstory. And what you did in this book, it's interesting because, um, you, like you said, in 2018, the IFE situation had just happened. And then yeah. right after that, or in 2019 or 2020, nice. the yeah. Sex for Grades BBC documentary came out and it yeah. became a very big thing. When it comes to sexual exploitation, especially in our universities, it's not a new story. It's not yeah. anything we don't know that is happening. But I think one of the things your book has done is to give more awareness and yeah. most importantly, continental at least, even though you did go even into the Americas, but continental research. Because I went through your book and you did 29 countries in Africa talking yeah. about this scourge. But let's start from the very beginning. And you, I, I like the fact that you wrote names. You were very open. You were very, you know, there's where we can want to write books on topics like this and we don't want to step on toes because they are real people with real stories, with real yeah. issues. You started with the case of two Nigerian professors. What really struck me in this particular story is that these two stories ended in two different ways, right? Yeah. And many times yeah. when this happens, we always expect that the outcome will be the same. What was your finding and what was even your personal opinion talking about the tale of two Nigerian professors? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the idea is just to bring out that contrasting outcomes in the two cases. And, and it also brings me to one interesting story. One of the principal characters in that story, one of the victims, I spoke to her at length. And uh, about three times. And at the end of the day, I could not publish a view because she now called me that her mom said she didn't want her to appear in my book. She didn't want her to be re-victimized again. And, and that struck me because I know that's what happens again and again. Somebody had been abused. And then by the time the story comes out, the society stigmatizes her, which is what happens most of the time. So it's, it's, it's a... I had to strike a delicate balance. Of course, I left our story out, but it, it also pained me because it also, it brought uh, me, it, it became graphic for me, the, the, the kind of uh, trauma, people who experience that kind of thing 
go through, especially in our kind of society. So I, in, in, in telling these two stories, I just want people to be aware of the, 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 the gravity of the situation we are dealing with. That of, I, that of uh, how the, the outcome of that of Calabar and the outcome of that of uh, Ife. Exactly, sir. And you touched on very importantly stigmatization. But before we go there, because you are a journalist, I like the fact yes. that you were, you were able to view this from an objective point of view. So you are not in the education system. You did this, you know, as a journalist. Minus what we can say, okay, moral issues. Every man is morally or every human being is prone, you know, to being yeah. morally shortchanged. What would you say is the other reasons that this has continued to thrive, even when noise has been made about it continuously? No, it's because of what it is. It's about power structure. Hmm. I mean, somebody has power over the other, and I believe it can always have its way and get away. I mean, everybody believes, most of the people can believe that because some people get caught. But you know that even as we are talking about it, right now on campus, some people are still doing it because they believe they can get away with it. And it's because of the unequal balance of power. I mean, you have power over students, and that's, that's, that's what's encouraged. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of abuse of power. Hmm. So when, when, you look, when, when you look at power structure in different forms, I mean, that's where, that's, 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 that's the way I want us to look at the problem. That's why the it. challenge is huge. So it's, it's about power structure. It's something that you believe you can do and get away with it. And, and that's, that's, I mean, as lecturers, you have power over your students. Hey, do you want to pass? Do you want to get, I mean, because some of us, when we were in university, we had some of these things too. You cannot pass my course on TV. It was even, during our time, sometimes it was even blatant. Hmm. You know some lecturers, <laughs> And I mean, they, they did it in such a way that uh, they were more or less above the law. Things are different now because I mean, some of these predators are getting caught, and with the example set, people now know that there are consequences of, for this uh, uh, blatant bad behavior that has gone on for years, decades. But it's interesting that you say abuse of power. And I like the fact that, you know, and which is something you also detailed in your book that was abuse of power. But there was an interesting word that I also kept seeing in your book. It was patriarchy, right? Yeah. And I don't know if it's an African, <laughs> an African thing, especially when it comes to the issue of patriarchy. Talk about how you feel patriarchy also helps to increase this issue of sexual molestation. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we see it, when I talk about patriarchy, we see it in different variants and at different levels. So when you not carry it to the educational sector, it becomes a problem. Hmm. It's everywhere where, may, I mean, this male domination kind of a, a problem is it's, it's different, at different levels, at different strata of, of our society. The challenge is now is it has come to the educational sector, which... I mean, you see it even, even uh, not even only among uh, uh, lecturers, but even between lecturers and lecturers. Hmm. I mean, there's a case I detailed when uh, 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 they reported a case, even to a female lecturer of abuse and said, give him what he wants. I mean, that's the kind of, that's, I mean, it's, you, can, you, can, you, you cannot justify that kind of thing, but it's reinforced by the fact that I mean, men are men, boys are boys. You know that kind of, uh, and it's a prevalent culture that we must deal with. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, if a woman, a female lecturer who ordinarily you, you go out and tell her, say, I beg, give, give him what he wants. And you cannot, if with that kind of attitude, I mean, it's a, uh, and that must have been informed by the fact that she had seen that kind of thing again and again, again and again. And again. And again. Was, yeah. So where do you begin to fight? And that is the one of the major concerns. Even reading your book and getting to the end, I mean, sometimes as well, you know, when you even look at, when you think of Africa <laughs> as a continent sometimes, sometimes like, people get to the point where we say, so where do we begin? You talked about penalization throughout the book, but it just seems like we report it, 
and nothing is done. We report it and the case is not taken up. Whether you went to Kenya or to Senegal or to Mauritius, the different countries you went to, you cited different stories where things happened, they were reported and nothing was done. What do you advise in such a situation? Yeah, I mean, we will keep pushing. I, 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 because, I mean, the, the, maybe now with, with, the, with, the, with the tools of technology, for instance, I mean, once the, the, some of these lecturers, lecturers can be exposed, it's no longer easy hmm. for these predators to be as blatant as they used to be. So it's, uh, we'll get there eventually, but it's not going to be an easy task. Excellent, sir. So we'll go on a short break now. And when we come back, I want us to now go almost detail by detail to the different situations in several countries that you mentioned. It was obvious that some things were socioeconomic issues, poverty also yeah. fed into Iberia, why some of these yeah. things thrived. So yes, exactly. So once we come back from this break, we will talk about that. We'll go on a short break now and come back continuing this very important conversation of sex for grades, not just in our universities, but even in our secondary and our primary schools. We'll be right back. You're welcome back to Chapters. And on this episode where we are talking about the very important conversation of sexual molestation in our schools, I still have with me my guest, Mr. Shegun Adeniyi. And before we went on the break, sir, thank you for giving us that background as to writing the book and also the body of work that you've done. But now I want us to go into Chapter 2, which you aptly titled Sexual Predators Across African Campuses. And I don't know how you did it, but you gave the example of 29. I, I had to count because I was just going from country to country. So I went back to the content and said, let me count 29 countries across Africa. And you talked about how this has panned out in these 29 countries. Before we go into this, how did you do this research? I think anyone who wants to do this kind of work will learn from what you've done because this is absolutely amazing. Yeah, when I, when I started, I actually... I mean, I had friends across the continent, and I, I used some of my friends, and I network on that mm. uh, friendship. I mean, so, so some of my friends who work in international organizations too. We have friends in so so countries, so they got me in contact with their own friends and many of mm. And I spoke to some of, some of them. That was how I started the conversation. And then, of course, I did research into those countries. To be able to know what is good, but I, I actually spoke to many people in some some of these countries to know the uh, the extent of whether do, they, do you have this kind of problems? Yeah, we have a lot of that kind of problem. They begin to share their experiences uh, and that of others with me. That's why I that was how I listed the country that I profiled. And it's amazing because just like you said, it was all over. It was all over, and there were different reasons. Uh, maybe I should start from. Sierra Leone. I don't know. I, I really found that story very sad. You talked about how a 14-year-old um, was yeah. dating her. Well, not necessarily dating because it's not like it was consensual, but her 37-year-old teacher. And the problem yeah. I found here was poverty, right? Yeah. You actually said here that, um, in fact, in Sierra Leone, for example, predatory sex between students and their teachers is so prevalent that it goes to high school and primary school students. And you said there was this student, when he asked, the student couldn't say no. And her mother is also aware that this is going on. But because yeah, she can't but... afford to pay school fees. Please talk about this, sir. Yeah, I, I, I discovered that uh, in worse situations, hmm. Women are usually the first victims, and I. That's why if you read that of Sarah Lou, not only Sarah Lou, if you see Liberia, yes. you will find the same connection. And United Nations, they actually mentioned it. So it's uh, so it is is uh, the the women and girls become easily vulnerable in a situation of uh, uncertainties, in a situation of war, in a situation of crisis. So in Liberia and Sarah Lou, where when the crisis, when the, I mean during the war and after that, when it was difficult, when there was poverty, so many many people were trading their dignity hmm. for all kinds of things. So if you can trade your dignity for for food, then you you can trade it for anything. So that's and the the the, the sad aspect is that in, mo, in some of the cases, the parents were even aware. 
So the problem in, uh, in Sierra Leone and Liberia became peculiar. I mean, we, the, there is always this challenge on campus before, but transactional sex was taken to a new level in where people were trading their dignity, not only for marks, for, for, for food, for all kinds of things. That's, that's why I, I did, uh, the, 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 the cases I detailed in uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia were in, in a way different from what to obtain in countries like mm. Nigeria, for instance. Mm. But it was still, still a case of power. Maybe power, in this case, I have what you want in terms of uh, financial resources, in terms of food, even beyond the grades I can. And also, exactly. I mean, these are people who are looking for better life. If they fail in school, where would they end up? So they, they, so they were more or less trapped in different ways. And the, 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 uh, the lecturers were, were able to exploit all those vulnerabilities. I mean, I also then, uh, when you talked about Central Africa Republic and this one as well, you said, in fact, the very people upon whom we rely to teach peoples how to protect themselves against AIDS are often the one passing across the virus. So in CAR, for example, the, the people that they had said should be the HIV, AIDS uh, teachers or the ones that maybe wouldn't be empowered by the likes of UN are now the ones sleeping with the students and passing across the virus. Will we call this a case of education gone wrong? Or how did you, I, I mean, I read that story and I, I was really just confused. It's, it's the same thing. I mean, taking ad, people taking advantage of, uh, their, of, of people under, people who ordinarily should be under their care. It's, 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 and it's, hmm. it all boils down to the power structure too. So how do we begin yeah, to change I, this power structure situation? Yeah, no, I mean it's a, it's when when you are you are you are you are in a position of weakness, and somebody is in a position of strength, and what you want? Okay, let's 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 break it down. Mm -hmm. These students are in school; they they know that they 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 they, they must, I mean, they must pass to get out of school. And these people are, are asking them what ordinary they should not give. But they also know that if they don't give this thing, these people are in a position to make life difficult for them. So they are, they are, they are more or less stranded, as it were. So that's, well, that's talking about the power structure. And they are, who do they report to? In most instances, the people they report to are not better than... The people they are reporting. Exactly. So, it's, so, so, so it becomes a problem. So where do I go? So they become trapped. So in such situations, many succumb and they give in. Of course, there are people who fight. But in you also look at those who fight, where do they end up? Mm. So when you see somebody who fought, and at the end of the day, you discover me, I mean, the person left school under uh, uh circumstances that, and at the end of the day you see the person uh, out of school out of job and with miserable life so you say so how, how is this what i want for myself so at the, so when you look at all those factors it is very very easy to fall into that kind of trap and just succumb to the 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 the, the, the on healthy on or the, or, 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 or the demands. It's not a straightforward issue. It's, it's still, not. It's a difficult approach, especially in our, within our environment. But those are issues that we deal with. I want us to talk about raising the girl child. And I know that you are a father of two daughters. You have two yes. daughters. And it's interesting yes. that when you mentioned... Uh, the late Professor Shukuma, he himself mentioned that he had daughters, which is why it affected him personally. Yes. One of the things yes. that I also saw in your book... Um, is that sometimes women are already raised in a way to make it feel like the men are better or yeah. the men are already more powerful. Is there a way that you think daughters can be raised differently so that even when you are faced with this, I know like you've said now, there are circumstances where you feel if I don't succumb, my life is over, I'm stranded. But besides that, is there a way... African women, and I'd like to keep this as yeah. African women, should be raised differently to see themselves almost as equal count counterparts to their males, whether he's someone, your lecturer, or yourself. Yeah. And for, for someone that has daughters as well, how would you speak yeah. to that? 
and, and, and you will discover something because I, I, I once wrote about this issue when there was this MTN advert, Mama and a Boy. Mm. And I wrote about it. And one of the, I, I saw an example because when I, di I did research on it, I discovered that actually it's actually women who, who actually promote this uh, uh, gender sector more than men. And I, would, and I saw an example like um, if you see a woman who has four children and all male, hmm. she will say, I have four boys. Hmm. If she has four children that are all female, he really would she say that she has four female, she would just say she has four children. So you have this kind wow. of a notion by some that, that promotes uh, superiority of the male child over the female, which is not true. And I also know that, I mean, as a father, I know that men are closer to their daughters than to their sons. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I've, seen it with my, I've seen it with several people. And I've also seen that maybe maybe that's the reason for it. Women are also closer to their sons than to their daughters. Maybe that's mm. not true, but I, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I've also seen something like that. Maybe maybe that maybe I, I don't have any scientific proof to that, uh, mm. but I know that they, they, so the, 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 the issue now is we should raise our women to be proud for who they are. Mm. And they are not in any way inferior. To their male counterparts. That's, that's is an important thing that we must build in them. So let's and if any man tries to mess them up, they must stand up and fight. Thank you, sir. So let's take it to the men. How then should the men be raised? Because I also think men are not being raised to respect women, which is why there is the abuse of power. But there is a way you can also grow up and just think, oh, a woman is someone that you can just play with as you so desire. I think men should be raised to treat every woman the way they would treat their mother. Mm. Because at least I know that whatever you may say, I mean, I, I, I'm closer to my mother than to my father. And I, I, I've seen many men like that. So if you can respect your mother, respect your daughter, respect every... If, you can, if men can respect every woman, every girl, the way they respect their mother, I think the message will be passed. Thank you very much. Please let us raise our women to be strong and raise yeah. our men to respect. Very important. Yeah. But let me even ask you, was there any, when you went through all these countries, was there anyone that really shocked you in terms of your findings? I mean, it's more or less the same thing. Yeah, all of, I mean, I wasn't shocked because, I mean, the, the shock for me was not in Africa, but the shock was that it's not only an African thing. And I discovered that it's a, it's a global challenge. Uh, because I, it's just I didn't want to. I, 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 I researched into several universities across the world, and I found this kind of problem. It may not be as prevalent as it is on the continent, but it's challenge is a global challenge. Mm. Mm. And I just didn't because I thought it's outside the scope of the book. Then you wanted to keep it to Africa, but there's yeah. something in the book: the issue of stigmatization. And it's interesting yeah. that you are stigmatized, even both by your fellow students. Yeah. Then more worrisome, you are stigmatized by friends of the lecturer, obviously. <laughs> so this culture of not being able to speak out, because across Ethiopia and many other place, places, like you said here, Ethiopia is a case in point. Few victims ever speak out. And in fact, you put the percentages there, which was very scary. If we cannot break the culture of speaking out, then where do we start? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. I mean, look at the issue of rape. Mm. It's so prevalent, but people are late come out because they are going to suffer. I mean, it's like double jeopardy. You have already been raped, and then you are going to be violated again by the way society would treat you. Mm. So, it's, it's, so we need to begin to look at how do we destigmatize mm. these issues. Until we do that, then people will not report. And if they don't report, the culture will continue. So that's, 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 that's actually a big challenge. So how do we deal with the culture of stigma? Because it's there, especially in our kind of society. Hmm. If a woman says it's raped, and then she wants to marry to get that woman that was raped, as if it was a, as if she had committed a crime. A crime was committed against her, but it would be like she had committed a crime to be raped. So, so you, you, it's, 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 the, 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 there has to be a change in the way society re uh, reacts and reflects on some of these issues. Absolutely. Otherwise, we will not have a, 
a solution to the problem. And truly, you know, we, we can talk about this, but we all need to do better. Because as you were talking as well, I was thinking about it and I said, all of us can have that. I read one of your stories and I remember talking to my producer. And I was like, the story didn't quite add up. Uh, one of the stories, one of the cases. You know, and I said, this is exactly the problem right here. Even I yeah. reading it, I'm already thinking, mm, do I believe her? Do I believe her not? Is this true? And it's these kinds of things when people are like, I cannot speak so the, out. That case, that case of the university professor, yes, the, the yes. professor of law. Yes. You know, the professor was very smart. <laughs> Excellent. But why would the guy, the guy is a brilliant guy. The guy came out with two one. Law school, she came out with two one. Wow. Because a very prominent family. So why would she lie out against, against the man? But if you read the professor, the way... He argued his case. He's, uh, I mean, I thought to myself, <laughs> being a professor of law, he, I mean, yeah, he knew not... how to poke the holes. Yeah, exactly. It was, it's, it's amazing. When we come back, we'll go on a short break now, and I'll come back to your last chapter, looking at the other side of the coin, which was, I mean, I like the fact that it was balanced, because there is also the other side of the coin that sometimes it might be the girls that throw themselves onto the lecturers. However, is that an excuse? But we'll look at that conversation when we return. This is a very important conversation and we'll continue right after the break. Welcome back to Chapters, still talking about the case of sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, sexual molestation in our schools, primary, secondary, and university. And I'm going to read out a quote um, from your book, Mr. Deni. Thank you for, you know, having this conversation with me. Uh, the quote you have here is written by Billy Wright, and he says, Physical intimacy with students is not now and never has been acceptable behavior for academicians. It cannot be defended or explained away by evoking fantasies of devoted professors and sophisticated students being denied their right to true love. Where power differentials exist, there can be no mutual consent. I thought this was a very powerful quote. And I just wanted to lead us into your chapter three, the other side of the coin. Like I said, sometimes, even as you noted in your book, some lecturers said, well, it was these people that threw themselves at me. In fact, the girls would just come, professor, give me A. Professor, I will give you my body. Give me this. For you, and you, you talked about many things in that chapter and even gave so many um, quotes by different people that you had spoken to. What would you say about this, even just from being a man, that I'm sure maybe as well in your line of work or profession, you've had such advances? You see, this is the most, this was the most difficult chapter for me to write. Why, sir? And at the end of the day, I asked myself whether I should. And because I gave it to several ladies, feminists and other academics, People in the academy, as well as respected women, and they said it was an important point for me to. So because I didn't want to be seen as making excuses hmm. for hmm. for predators. But I, I, I and you see the way I carried it, I quoted several women and all that. Yes. It's, it's deliberate because I also know there are some uh, students, female students, who believe that they will use what. They have to get I mean, what they want. Is, I will use what I have to get what I want. I worked with ICPC, and there was a particular case, which I detailed in the book, of a female student who was the, the aggressor in terms of uh, I, on the issue that we are talking about. And uh, so that presented a, 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 a case for me to look at the issue of where the, the real predator happens to be the female student who mm. wants to use the lecturer to get what she wants, in this case, good grace, mm. and believes that she can trade her dignity for it. But I also think in such a way that even in instances where female students throw themselves at a the lecturer, he, such a lecturer is duty-bound to say no. So that's Thank the you. message I, 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 I passed at the end of the day. But also citing the case... Uh, but I needed to cite the, the, I needed to do that chapter because, I mean, of the, the fact that it also exists. And many lecturers use that as an excuse. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> through, I, mean yeah, I remember during our time, the, the, there's one particular lecturer, very notorious, who say, I mean, when some students come late to class, say, you, 
and you will be coming to my and the way you even talk to them mm. say, you you will not attend class and then you will be coming to uh, to my to, to be knocking at my door asking for all kinds of so oh you you, you that so, such cases also exist and i need to then to point it out but also to pass the message that even in such instances i mean the lecturer is still duty bound to behave responsibly as it were and that's the message i i intended to pass and that's and i think i passed the message because i quoted several so i the people i quoted there are uh, female lecture people in the uh, women in the academic world who will be able to even in such instances what your lecturer do and and that's the yes I, sir. I i just felt that i should pass the that such situations do also exist I, I, and I, well, that's one of the reasons why I think the book is very balanced. So it's obvious that he came at it objectively. And just like you said, you quoted here Dr. Jemima Nunu. I hope that is how to um, pronounce her name. A female lecturer at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. And she did say, even if they initiate it, even if the females yeah. beg for it, even if they show you all the contours of their body, you see the onus and responsibility lies with the lecturer. It is yeah. believed that you are older. It is believed yeah. that you are wiser. And just like you said in the book, it's also believed that there is a code of conduct that your university has placed on you that you should not cross these lines it's with not, your yeah. students. So it goes yeah. back to the lecturer. Let's talk about penalties. And one of the reasons why it might seem like this scourge has continued is that either the penalties for sexual exploitation are not even clear in some universities, just like you pointed out, even across the different countries that you mentioned. So it's either for some of them, they are not clear. They are not clearly spelt out, this is what will happen. Or for some of them, even if they are clearly spelt out, by the time you feel you follow due process, nothing happens to the lecturer. And so it emboldens other people. So when it comes to penalties, what did you find out in this research? How strong are the penalties that exist for this? No, I mean, the, the, the penalties were not strong. It's just now that the conversation is... Because most schools don't even have any code of conduct for lecturers. Mm. It's now that they... I mean, it's becoming that NUC is even coming to the picture and always know that it's wrong for a lecturer to harass students. But if there are no real penalties, as there were no, no, in many of the messages before, so it's, uh, uh, that's why the thing has first out for a long time. But now, the, uh, the conversation has shifted now. Now there are penalties, most of the investors. That's why it's interesting to know that when the Senate started the bill on sexual harassment, you know, as, as we went there and challenged it, that sexual harassment is like any other crime. There is, there is nothing special about it. Yes. As we went openly yeah. and they attacked it. And what are they talking about? Are, are there no sexual harassment in National Assembly? Mm. Are there, is there any law uh, about sexual harassment in the US? Why should they single out? They mm. couldn't see that the academic space is a different space. Mm. That, is, is a, that we are dealing with a difficult problem. They just generalized it. So when you have lecturers who think like that, mm. and it was a sort of harassment. It tackled it. So eventually the, the bill was passed by the Senate. We are still waiting for the House version. So it's uh, so for us to have a law. But I mean, that's where we are right now. So when you have lecturers with that kind of mindset, you can understand why we have the current as we have had over the years. <sighs> We refuse to lose hope because, you know, so like you said, when you have lecturers with that kind of mindset, and mindset can be the hardest thing to change in life, yeah. but we believe that maybe with these penalties and also believing that as the penalties are also being followed, then things yeah. will begin to change. No, the academic example is very good. Yes. So to know that the lecturer can actually go to jail for sexual harassment, I mean, it's a... Uh, is a good uh, example. Yes, sir. Okay, so you talked about some things like here. You talked about uh, some people had said marking of scripts. Maybe if you change, and I just want us to sort of because you never know who watches this sometimes and the kinds of solutions that might even help to just curb or to just you know reduce in a way. You, so you said some people federal funding. Um, I know that you did mention here uh, in page one thirty that people are exploring. Also, lecturers not to mark their students' scripts. So one lecturer teaches, another lecturer marks. <laughs> Sometimes I read this and I said, but lecturers are friends. But <laughs> maybe that can help in yeah, a way. We, we are just looking at a situation of, uh, 
how we can mitigate this challenge. Exactly. I don't know how that will work out because I'm not in the academic environment. Mm. But these were suggestions I got from people in the academic environment themselves. That look, you can have a situation where some lecturers would, I mean, where you, you won't grade the students you taught. I, I don't know how that will work out, but there are some universities that have tried that kind of experiment. Mm. which didn't come from me what it's i came yeah, from I other people, from people yes and this one also said here that people must we must also be very public about in fact the person said we can be col collecting the names of offenders monthly and advertising in all the newspapers to expose them because like you said in your book this happens and it's not every story that becomes public it might happen and the university just manages it sorts it maybe the parents go talk to the vice chancellor or something and it goes but someone said here that one way to also help this is also to make it very public expose them talk about it like you said i mean different people were giving their own yeah. um no, ways I didn't, I didn't know how prevalent this problem is until i wrote the book hmm. and i got calls from prominent people especially when you should have spoken to me wow. i would have spoken about lecture so, so I, also, I was shocked there is one prominent person, he's a billionaire, he called me. He said he spent extra year in the university. He said, what was my offense? He said he was dating one guy that didn't know the lecturer was... Uh, uh, wow. Uh, that lecturer Also going after the lecturer. Yes. yes. He said after the graduation, he told the guy, well, you could have told me now, because the guy knew why. He said it was the guy who actually told him. Hey, do you know why you spent extra years because of Wow. Hey, you could have told me, I would have left you. So you have that kind... I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's something that had gone on for it. There was a WhatsApp group that some people were, and the group started when they were praising some lecturers. And while they just said, hey, hmm. you people you should stop pressing. You don't know these people. I mean, so it's, so you, you, have, you have had people have bottled up all kinds of uh, uh, traumatic experiences for years, some for decades. So, and this, we cannot continue to pass this program from generation to generation. So, now we must deal with the challenge. That's, 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 uh, deal with it, has, it has gone on for too long. Yes, sir. Yes, because sir. it has debased education for several women. Hmm. I mean, it uh, uh, has made life difficult for several. I mean, some people have, uh, uh, some people cannot get over the trauma they yes. experience on campus. Yes. Please, when we talk about uh, female students who believe in using what they have to get what went, there are some who did that to pass through university. So, and there are people who work diligently, and they tell some people with the same brush. I will know how he, she mm. got the back. So, so the, the problem comes at different levels, and we have to challenge. We have to tackle. We have to tackle the challenge. Wow. We indeed have to tackle the challenge, and I think we all have a role to play, whether as parents, whether even this in itself, creating awareness about it more and the things that can be done. And I think everyone, whether you are in the academic sector or you are just a concerned Nigerian, this is a book you must get. Now, Mr. Adini, you mentioned that you actually have done, uh, there's a newer version of this yeah. book. Please no, actually, talk about I, the newer I, version. I, I I actually didn't say that, that copy. I, I printed 5,000 copies. We gave it, we gave it out, all the 5,000 copies to wow. agencies and all. And, and all our UST campus is free. We now reprinted after the webinar that we did at IFE. The IFE, uh, uh, University did a webinar for me where the vice president spoke, the 14th MA of Kanu, uh, Mohamed Sanusi to spoke, the deputy senate president spoke there, Mrs. Ifueko. Uh, Karu, Mr. Mr. Uh, Steve Orosa, many people spoke at the webinar and I just uh, transcribed the old interventions and made it part two of the of the book. So this is this is the you are holding the uh, I'm holding wrong version. An archaic <laughs> version. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> showing that. Of, so that's the version <laughs> of the book everybody should get. Yes. The Which white is why version. Is the of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Once we are done with this, I will get that version of the book. Yes, I'll send it to you. Thank you so much, <laughs> sir. This has been Thank you, man. this has been an amazing conversation. I mean, it's um <laughs> I think sometimes it's just for us not to lose hope. There's a tendency to talk about yeah. these kinds of things that have been for years. And, you know, just yeah. like we've said, where can the change come from? But it's important not to lose hope. And in closing, I will just read um, 
one of the things that you said here, and funny enough, it's the last words from this, cup, from this book, and I'm going to read, you said you concede the last word to Nabila Abdumalik, a Pan-African and feminist writer from Ethiopia. And she said, we must refuse to accept even what will be considered borderline harassment. We must not even, even if you just lecture saying, ah, you are, no, nothing, nothing like that. She said, we must provide a conducive environment where a survivor can report and be heard and swift action is taken and where survivors get the support, psychosocial and otherwise, if we're to build together, and I love this part, not only the Africa we want, but more fundamentally, the Africa we need for ourselves as well as coming generations, we must do better as a people. And I think that is really the message for each and every one of us. We must do better as a people. And we all have something we can do. That's what we need to understand. You, you, we didn't talk about one of the things you said in this book, enablers. You might be someone that knows your friend lecturer is doing this. You just turn a blind eye. You know your friend has gone through this. I tell her, keep quiet. Don't talk about this. They are going to stigmatize you. You know, those are That's little ways. There's a story I actually told there of a friend who, who shared with me. He visited one of these campuses. He visited a town in the southwest. And the friend said, uh, I will send to you uh, one Some of my girls. students to keep you company for the night. It's, it's just, yes. And for that kind of thing, you can say, oh, no, don't worry. But even in just making a very dismissive statement, it's also enabling. Because then you see and yeah. you know what your friend is doing. Yeah. Yes, and you don't want to shake the table as we are, as is our balance now, shaking tables. <laughs> Maybe we need to start shaking some more tables. Thank you so much, sir, for this conversation. It has been absolutely enlightening. I want to thank you all for watching today's episode of Chapters. This has been enlightening, but much more. I think it just puts fire under each and every one of us. One of the things Mr. Adini mentioned now, and even in the book, is that this has trauma for years. You might see people, they are okay, they are going about their business, but you never know the weights and the traumas they are carrying because of things like this that have happened to them in the past. Just like we said, we must do better as a people. We've come to the end of this particular episode, but not this conversation. It continues. It continues on our dining tables, in our universities, in our primary schools, in our secondary schools. It continues. Remember that it's not just about what you know, but what you do with what you know. Until the next episode, God bless you. Thank you.